welcome navid bhai to campus thanks so much for coming it has been a long time since no, we have uh, known each other and we have been waiting to meet in person but finally we could make it so so glad to be meeting you well, like like vai sahal bhai you know thanks for having me it's uh, i'm so, yeah we kept talking and i'm finally glad to be able to see this campus come to life and thank you for having me really most welcome uh, to rishiyo university and uh, i wanted to talk to you regarding a very fascinating journey you know, you, you uh, are from the healthcare field and you but you're not limited to to the world of healthcare you've experienced so much so i wanted to no let's start with your uh, childhood how did you decide to go into the field of medicine and become a doctor what was your sure. influence to do that and then uh, your journey to becoming a doctor 100% so i mean uh, you know quite unlike what it seems life uh, is so to say unplanned right i grew up wanting to be a bus conductor to begin with and then uh, you know a chef and then a pilot uh, and the airline industry came crashing down and you know i started reflecting upon what i really want and my parents are physicians and it was the best way to give back to the community you know i had seen you know patients uh, presumed dead come to life by administering a small dose of insulin for example and all of that really fascinated me the way in which our body would function um and so that really drew me to medicine uh, obviously my parents influence on my life has been very large and uh, you know just seeing this sense of satisfaction on their face when they came back home and that smile uh you know uh, to quote my dad he would often say that the joy of uh you know giving uh, a baby to the mother is is something that no money can buy and i'm yeah. sure uh, you know you would feel the same so congratulations uh on the new arrival so 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 all of that really fascinated me but what ended up happening was um uh you know when i was in medical school why i was really fascinated uh, in, in 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 the variety and ways in which our human body functions i somehow felt limited within the four walls of that hospital um uh, and i really wanted to in some ways create a bigger impact right and impact that would not limit me to a medicine ward or if you know like a pediatrics ward um and that in some ways you know then started crafting my journey i started becoming a part of various forums uh you know uh served dr manmohan singh in his uh the y20 in st petersburg as the head of state worked with david cameron uh discuss israel palestine crisis which you know is very uh so to say relevant in the current times but that in some ways crafted my life's narrative um, and you know uh, eventually got me to where i am today so this was your your experience with forums and uh, learning new things going to new uh, pouring into new horizons that was during your college time or when was it yeah it was during my medical school so in fact it started from my uh, second year of medical school i you know i was a part of uh, the indian students parliament or the bharatiya chhatra sansad and i was a student speaker and student leader um so had these interactions wonderful interactions with dr raghunath mashelkar ji uh you know with the dalai lama uh and and that in some ways was like oh my god you know this is eye opening for me uh and throughout the years you know then in third year i was in uh, you know when i was in third year medical school i was i uh, went to the us as a part of uh, the international federation of medical students association representing india so it was during the medical school i owe it uh, i owe it to my mentors and uh, uh, you know for for allowing me to explore those options but yeah it was during at at that time and um, i'm i'm grateful for my school for for giving me those opportunities quite unlike you know most medical schools i would say great and then you went to the us to to practice as a doctor or what was that assignment yeah so i um, you know i still wanted to explore being a doctor and i wanted to give it one last shot so i went to the johns hopkins school of medicine where i uh, you know did my clerkships in obstetrics and gynecology okay. uh, uh with dr jean anderson who was a fascinating mentor uh and that's where i really realized that whilst you know clinical medicine is beautiful for people who really enjoy it maybe i wasn't really meant for it because i still felt limited within the four walls of that hospital and so i started digging a little bit into global health research um and uh, you know that interested me and then you know after that um, i decided that okay i'm going to you know uh, be a public health pay me into the public health space or 
you know, use that as a gateway to uh, crafting something else. So that is how from medicine you went into public health and, and you chose Harvard, none of the Harvard to do that. So what was your experience at uh, studying at Harvard? Well, it was, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was fascinating. I feel like what ends up happening in universities like that uh, and in universities like IIT is you are, you're, you come from an ecosystem which is 50 levels below and you're just thrown into a very different world, right? Like I remember uh, I, I had asked uh, my mentor, Sarah Singer, who's now at Stanford, I said, am I the mistake that Harvard made? <laughs> and she started to laugh and she's like, why do you feel so? And I, I said, you know, on my left is a, you know, a Fulbright scholar. I have a Rhodes scholar on the right. There's like a 65 year old kind gentleman from the U.S. Army who is taking some time off. And I asked him, I said, hey, I mean, you know, you are a 65 year old plastic surgeon. I'm sure he makes incredible amounts. Why are you here? He said, I wanted my granddaughter to say that my nana went to Harvard, you know. <laughs> so it, it literally changes that experience was out of the mind. Here were people that I dreamt of. I remember that, you know, as a kid, I used to write an essay on Dr. Amartya Sen, that my favorite Nobel laureate is Dr. Amartya Sen, you know, for the work he's done in health economics. And here I'm in class two feet away learning from him. And he's looking at me, he's like, this is not how you write a policy memo, Namit, or or standing behind Atul Gawande in a queue and being like, hey, Namit, like, you know, I'm going to take a while to pick my candy. Like, why don't you go first? So it was very fascinating. And um, it literally changed my outlook towards the world. I I feel like sometimes, you know, and I'm, uh, you know, I've quoted this again, time and again, of how proud I am at, uh, for, for Rashid for taking this up, that in India, our, our education system is very tunnel vision, right? Like, if you're a doctor, you're meant to think in one direction. That, you know, you finish your MBBS, do your MD, do your DM, work in a hospital, start a hospital. Our system really doesn't allow us to think out of the box, which is what Harvard ended up doing and which is what I'm sure, uh, you know, Rishi Hood would end up doing. And so it opened my, you know, my mind and my head to different possibilities. And then you know, even after your Harvard experience, you sort of didn't limit yourself to public health as a focus, you, you, you sort of expanded that into working in the government. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, you know, um, uh, as, as, as you know, I when I was at Harvard, I uh, we all have to do these compulsory internships. And so, out of the blue, I had uh, uh, I had emailed um, um, Suresh Prabhu, sir, saying that sir, sir was in the radius at that time, saying, I want to learn public relations, I want to learn how to you know, managed in the time of crises, learning more about organizational management and design. And railways is a mammoth organization, right? Like yeah. for so many years, the railway had a separate budget yes. uh, and it employs more people than the Indian Army. Yeah. And so I was like, that was a great place to learn. And so, uh, you know, I stepped into that role. Um, uh, Sir was very kind enough in, in, you know, having me for a few weeks and a few months eventually. Um, uh, so I started learning of how these government machineries function, how to interact with people. Because again, you know, on one day, the Honorable Minister was interacting with, uh, you know, a, a farmer from a corner in Maharashtra. And in the next hour, he was interacting with the CEO of like a multinational giant. And the ease at which with the conversations would flow was just, there's so much to learn from that. So I ended up doing that. Uh, I also ended up uh, launching... Uh, you know, this small social entrepreneurship kind of a startup with one of my mentors, Dr. Thomas Burke, uh, which uh, prevents deaths due to uh, pregnancy-related complications or PPH. So it's a small device. It costs about $4 versus, you know, the current device, which is $500. US dollars. It's 99 to 100% effective. Wow. Uh, it's still there? It's still there, yeah. It's in the National Health Plan of India now. So about 7 million women have access to this device. Wow. Today, uh, it's called the SMUBT, and you know, Doctor Work is the is the brain and the inspiration behind it. But yeah, so uh, you know, I wanted to get that this kind of a startup experience, so did that, and you know, that coupled with the government experience again opened a new gateway to looking at uh, you know entrepreneurship and the commercial world, so to say. Right. And and then what happened then? Is so when you went to Shazan? no, I I actually so I then uh, so to say decided. Then I had a, you know, a more clear vision of what I wanted to do with my life. And I realized that I wanted to be in the venture capital, private equity, healthcare okay. space, uh, or so to say, uh, uh, in the portfolio operations of growing companies, right? 
which are working in healthcare which are working in healthcare oh. and in biotech uh, and so i did my post doctoral fellowship uh, in mucous and immunology and genetics at the mass general hospital of the harvard medical school uh, so for a year uh, i worked uh, at the mitchell lab uh, on uh, you know on bacteria and how they you know uh, on, on women's reproductive tract infections how could they be used as a source of uh, preventing recurrent infections at a minimal cost so fascinating work with the bugs to develop a certain vertical expertise within the healthcare domain and uh, right after that yes i, I moved to the shwetan scholars program in china okay and uh, so you know china itself is a kind of an enigma so we, we don't <laughs> understand it fully and then you, you've been there and that too after gaining significant global exposure of, of, of traveling and of studying in the us so what was the uh, factor that took you to china and What, what kind of things you did there in the Shawshank Schools program? Because that's also a very selective program sure. where you people from around the world. Yeah, so I think one of my, um, you know, uh, Shawshank Scholars is again a fascinating experience. So, uh, you know, as we sit here today, I, I, it takes me back to that room in JW Marriott in New York, where for my interview, I had the Director General of the CIA, uh, mm-hmm. General David Petraeus. I had. the prime minister former prime minister of australia uh, honorable kevin rudd i had steve shortman who was a chairman and ceo of blackstone i had rob garris who was an admissions director they were personally interviewing they were personally interviewing so nine people <laughs> and you sit in a chair and you in those 30 minutes were the most fascinating but also uh, you know i mean the scariest moments of my life uh, and that really said a lot about the program it's a program that tries to bring in about 140 people from different parts of the world for a transformative experience of a lifetime uh, so everybody lives in china we are based on tsinghua which is one of china's most elite universities um we are taught by professors from harvard stanford mit oxford cambridge and from you know tsinghua beida um and steve shortsman uh takes personal address so you know he's present there um and and you get to interact with uh, you learn a lot about you know leadership for example uh, in the time of crisis so you would have these guest sessions with uh, john kerry you know was a former secretary of state and now the envoy for climate change for the us government um, kevin rudd was uh, you know a fellow in residence so he would talk about uh, you know how do you take those decisions um, so uh, and i think for me the reason why i picked shortsman was uh, two right one was i was fascinated by the growth of china right like uh, they have been able to lift about 850 million people out of poverty in a matter of 20 odd years provide health insurance to all so from a physician standpoint that was very fascinating uh, b it was an uh, an experience to live you know eat play study together with incredible bunch of people and these people are not necessarily very good on paper right these are people who are passionate about what they do so we had musicians we had lawyers we had people from finance we had physicians and you come together from different communities discuss you know various geopolitical issues and i have learned more uh through my conversations over meals in the program than i have learned in the classroom and i think i went to shortland scholars for that so um, you know highly recommend And, and that is when you uh, moved back to India. Yeah. So once I graduated from the program, uh, you know, like I mentioned, I was very interested in venture capital funds and private equity. So I joined uh, one of China's largest VC funds called Northern Life Venture Capital. It's a five billion dollar fund okay. investing primarily in healthcare, T and T, and advanced tech. I was leading their India and emerging economies expansion, especially in the healthcare field. So I moved back to India. Uh, because again i was trying to find ways to bridge these gaps in healthcare access to innovation and technology right which were affordable uh so to me again what china was able to do in terms of the affordability angle uh was fascinating so if we could bring in our portfolio companies from there to here in case we could bring our portfolio companies from the us to here and invest in very promising indian entrepreneurs whose companies we could take global right because we had that breadth of expertise within the fund So I joined that fund. Uh, you know, was working with them for uh, for quite a while before uh, you know uh, the India-China geopolitical tensions kind of took over. And uh, your recent uh, uh, role of 
leading a startup. That's also very interesting. So, would you like to tell us more about what you are doing uh, in that startup and the, the kind of work that's very cutting edge in the food sector? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so I recently joined this company called Perfect Day. Uh, we are, uh, you know, funded by Tenacity Canada Pension Plan. We have about four hundred fifty million dollars in funding, and what we primarily work on is producing animal-free dairy. Um, and so what we're getting to is, um, you know, we've developed a technology uh, which, according to a recent uh, LCA report or life cycle assessment report, proves that uh, we generate 85 to 98% less greenhouse gas emissions compared to regular dairy farming. Okay. So our goal is to, you know, explore the sustainability angle. Um, very few people, I think, uh, realize that uh, the, the animal industry contributes significantly uh, to, the, to the greenhouse emissions and the kind of work that you're doing. I think. So, so is that is that one of the reasons why you uh, chose to do uh, this, this kind of... Yeah, I, I mean, that was one of the big reasons, right? Like, I've always, you know, after having gone to Harvard, after having been a short-term scholar, I feel like what these places have done to me is helped me run behind dreams that are bigger than myself, Right to chase these ideas that will change the world that could be very strong in the healthcare sector, on the climate change, sustainability angle, food security angle. And that really was my first goal. The second goal was I also wanted to be in a company which was at an exponential or escape velocity phase, okay. right? Uh, where we had solid funds backing the idea. In fact, you know, Bob Iger, who's a former chairman and CEO of Walt Disney, joined his first ever non-Disney board after Apple, second ever non-Disney board after Apple with this company. And so that really stamped my belief in this idea. So I wanted to be, uh, you know, associated with a company which was at that phase and where we were trying to, you know, grow the teams more. Third and most importantly, I feel like our entire team is very bullish on the idea of making it here, right? Because I feel like, uh, you know, you and I have these conversations that, India is a place where we have this incredible talent pool that is untapped, so to say. And if we could use that talent pool to grow the country, uh, to grow the company, um, I feel like yeah, we can achieve, uh, you know, the impossible, to be honest. And in, and in that process, you would have brought a lot of scientific knowledge, technical knowledge also to, to India. And you would definitely yeah. give a boost to the Make in India movement. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, we, we in fact have a research and development team in Bangalore. Uh, the, the, we currently have about 65 to 70 scientists okay. uh, who you know are working day in and day out trying to develop this technology further. Uh, we've also recently bought uh, 110,000 square feet space where we're building out a bigger research facility. And we are planning to build out our manufacturing plants and facilities in India. So we have a solid R&D base we look, always on the lookout for the best scientists, um, you know, who work on fermentation, who work on probiotics and trying to grow that. And like I mentioned, you know, it's it's not really hard to combine in India because you have these fantastic institutes like your alma mater, IIT, you know, which where you have people who are very passionate about what they do and are willing to work towards, uh, you know, um, a bigger idea and chase a bigger dream. Okay. And, and if I, because till now, the journey has been so diverse and probably you've not uh, left any domain <laughs> untouched. Uh, so, but if, if I ask you, where do you think uh, maybe in five years, ten years, from, uh, is that something that you would have in mind that this is where you would go from now or you've left it? To yeah, well, well, you know, I mean, we always have plans in life. Uh, you know, I actually, perfect day happened to me by chance in, in all honesty. And I think that's a message that I want to give out that it's okay to take those risks. I was supposed to move back to the U.S. to join a PE fund and then the COVID crisis hit. And so, you know, uh, given a lot of complications, I started reflecting upon what I really want. I spent a year putting my white coat back again, working in a hospital, you know, working with the government on the COVID-19 response. And during that time, when I was also reflecting, I started to realize what I really, really want from life, right? Uh, and while... B fund is a fantastic idea of growing companies. I really wanted to get down and be, you know, be, be in the company, get dirty, you know, so to say. And so uh, perfectly came through. So uh, 
in some ways it's unplanned. If you ask me what my five year goal is, is in the next five years, uh, uh, you know, I want to either grow a, my own company in the healthcare space or move back onto the other side of the table with a venture capital fund, growing very promising companies and betting on incredible entrepreneurs that we really have in India. Uh, the 10 year goal would obviously, um, if, uh, you know, if, if everything falls in place, is to work at the highest levels of government and policy um, to, to bring about grassroots level change, right? Uh, and so if I can, you know, walk on that path and walk successfully, that would be my plan. Um, I, I, you know, I hope that at the end of my retired life, you have a chair for me here. <laughs> yes. uh, I'm so glad to be associated with you guys. And I also enjoy teaching. So, you know, whilst I'm doing all of that, I want to continue to teach and train the next generation of global leaders because, you know, I feel like one of the most fascinating thing that I recently read, uh, you know, Bob Iger's autobiography, which is called uh, The Ride of a Lifetime. Uh, and he says that it's important of, you know, when to leave and when to transfer that kind of power and when to train. And I feel like that training component is, is has been missing for a while. Uh, uh, in terms of vocational education, which, you know, you are bringing to life. So uh, that is how I presume our journey to be, but we'll see. Yeah, we are very glad to have you associated with uh, Richard University. And I'm sure that when the students come here and they listen to you, they learn from you, it will be such an inspiring experience for, for all of them. So we look forward to that. No, thank you. No, I'm very, very excited. You know, I, uh, yeah, I'm so glad that all of us met and shared this common vision of, you know, fighting for the greater good, right? I feel like, um, uh, you know, it, it, it gives me goosebumps because my dad would always say, uh, my dad came from very humble backgrounds and he would always tell me that education is the most powerful weapon to change the world, yeah. right? Like no matter where you come from, no matter, you know, what your background is, if you have good education and if you have the will to succeed, you can literally ace anything that you want to run behind. And I feel like what you're doing here is such an integral part of what needs to be done, right? We want people to to open their eyes and ears to to think beyond just medicine, for example, yeah. or beyond just engineering. And through your programs, you know, I've, uh, I'm, like you know, I'm a big fan of the university. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know you haven't paid me for saying all of this. <laughs> but but I, I really think, you know, if you look at the MB in healthcare management program, like it's, again, very, very fascinating to see the kind of coursework you would bring in uh, because they range from leadership to organizational management to design thinking, right? And those really open up your mind to, to think outside the box. And so, yeah, uh, I'm very glad to be associated. Hope to, you know, be sitting in this classroom filled with students and teaching again. But if, since we have a school of healthcare, so what would be your message particularly to the students who are getting into healthcare? Because because uh, we also want them to think beyond the obvious, sure. yeah, obvious yeah. healthcare careers. So, yeah, yeah. so, so and you are a testimony that <laughs> healthcare is not limited to that. No, so I, you know, one of the biggest messages that I have is, you know, open your eyes and ears, be open to ideas. Uh, with the school of health, what you need to know is, for example, if you're a doctor, right, people have this notion and I'm glad that, you know, we are now in a phase of breaking it, but you, like I mentioned, you do your MBBS, you do your MD, your DM, and you reach a certain stage, but there are different options, right? A doctor can be a fantastic medical legal lawyer if you end up doing a JD. A doctor can get a master's in public health or a PhD in being a fantastic public health advocate. Uh, you can get a degree in public policy and be a fantastic healthcare policymaker. Um, and to be honest, the current times, like the COVID-19 pandemic has in some ways proved uh, that you need healthcare workers to think above and beyond their line and call of duty, right? Right. Um, like, it's just fascinating. If you look at, uh, you know, I was reading data someday, uh, the day before, India has vaccinated close to 23 crore people, right? And whilst, uh, you know, whilst that number might seem small in terms of the size of population, it's literally like two times the, you know, population of different countries around the world. If you look at the population of Canada, for example, you know, we've probably vaccinated two times the population of Canada or something of that sort. Um, so what's fascinating is there have been brains that have been working 
you know, constantly trying to design that vaccination drive. You know, I mean, you go to a wedding and when you walk into a buffet, your mind is confused what to eat. You know, and what should, where will the person walk in from? Where will he pick the plate from? What should, where the dessert counter should be? Imagine you are, you are planning a vaccination drive for 1.3 billion plus people. Yeah. Yeah. And there are strong healthcare workers and policymakers behind this. So I think that should really open your eyes and ears to what you can do beyond. If you look at, you know, the courses offered in the School of Healthcare, for example, you know, the school that works on uh, lab technicians and on more on those like COVID-19 pandemic, the maximum work yes. has been done by people in the lab space. Yeah. You know, collecting those swabs, collecting those swabs right, uh, collecting blood test reports. Those are such an integral part of the healthcare system, the allied services, right? Um, and they were often underestimated. But now more than ever, the pandemic has highlighted the importance of such healthcare workers. And so my, yeah, so, to, so I, I mean, I, I needn't really say much, uh, even though I've said a lot, I feel like... Um, Think outside the box, you know, be open to ideas. Don't restrict yourself to just one vertical in your life. If you start exploring, you'll find what you're calling is, right? You'll find where your heart lies. I think what's important is when you go to bed at night, you sleep well and you sleep with a smile, uh, you know, knowing that you've made that impact and knowing that you're working and you're enjoying what you're doing. Uh, and so I feel like that's a, that work should not feel like work. That, that's uh, so so much uh, so very inspiring. Thanks for sharing that. If I uh, reflect on whatever you've shared uh, you know, uh, in this talk, some some key themes is you know, we can we can plan and we should plan, but we should also be open. We should keep our ears and eyes open to exploring new things because we don't know when they would come and what what they bring uh, to us. The second very interesting recurring theme in your uh, you know, uh, story has been the role of mentors. Sure. I, think, I think you've significantly gained from from the kind of mentorship uh, that you've received, and and now uh, from from the giving back nature that you have, it it's, it tells that you also want to help the next generation uh, in that mentorship. And the third uh, interesting thing was the kind of conversations and how they have added to your learning experience, whether it is with, with your peers, with your mentors, with your colleagues. I think that's something that uh, all of the people who are watching this talk should should pick up that every conversation can become a learning experience. It, it depends on how open we are uh, to, to learning. So thanks, thanks a lot for uh, sharing that. Not at all. No, absolutely. And I feel like you've, you know, you've summarized it really well. Um, if you're not open to ideas, uh, you know, if you're not open to listening, if you, you see, it's okay to, uh, you know, hold your fort. Uh, but at the same point in time, it's, it's important that you listen, right? I feel like, um, you know, the the people who've been most successful in life are the ones who know when to step back and listen. Yeah. So I couldn't highlight more and absolutely, you know, I'm here because of a lot of my members and happy to pay it forward. So, um, yeah, can't wait. Thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, helping us uh, with that and sharing your wonderful ideas uh, with our viewers. So that was Dr. Namit Choksi. As they say in the school time that, you know, okay, doctor, but I think you, you, you said you, you started thinking, what next? <laughs> now we have to think something more. So thanks a lot for uh, joining us today in this talk and inspiring our audience. No, thank you, Sahil Bhai. And, uh, you know, yeah, uh, so grateful again for the opportunity and, you know, happy to play a role in, in growing this beautiful institution that you've, uh, you know, put together along with your team. Uh, more power to all of you and, uh, you know, uh, may God be with all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Sahil Bhai. Thanks for watching.